Hi, everybody. It's Brad here from Caribou Heart Organics. It's Sunday night. It's 8 o'clock, and that means it's time for another episode of Caribou Heart TV. It's a very special episode today. Watch last week's episode. You know that this weekend we're going to do an interview piece. You've heard me mention his name before on the show, and you've also heard me talk a lot about how every time I go into Caribou Garden Supply, shout out to them, I end up sitting around there bullshitting with them for a half hour or more. Well, this guy here, he can actually vouch for that because more often than not, he was the guy standing behind the counter that I was bullshitting with when I went down there. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce to you, Rick, the old guy. Good morning, Brad. How are you? Oh, I'm doing really good, buddy. How are you today? Well, not bad for an old guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, glad to be uh, glad to be on the show and uh, and uh, looking forward to it. Oh, we're glad to have you here, man. Um, it's just we we well, we both love talking shop here, so why not put it on camera for other people that like watching idiots like us jabber on about cannabis, right? So it's, uh, <laughs> sure, I, I think we'll have a lot of fun with it. Uh, both seem to like kind of joking around and taking the piss out of each other a little bit. And uh, well, like I said, talking shop, that's the main thing. We, we both love talking about weed. So Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> before, we, before we get into the little bit of Q&A, is there anything you'd like to tell, tell the people about yourself or do you want to just get straight into it? Well, uh, just to give you a little bit of background, I, I do have a fair uh, a fair amount of experience in the industry. Uh, actually, I go back like 35 years. Uh, so I have every right to be uh, referred to as the old guy. I've been around a little while. Uh, it all started, yeah, it all started for me back in 1985. And uh, uh, it was it was a funny story how I really got involved in, in uh, cultivation. Um, it really was never my intention. I was just a, a, a pot smoker and uh, and would buy my regular uh, ounce of pot. And uh, after a while, I thought, well, maybe what I should be doing is buy a little bit more and then I can sell it to my friends. And who knows, maybe I can smoke my pot for free. So I went to my dealer. And uh, I said, uh, I'd be interested in getting into the business. Well, when I said that, his eyes lit up. He got all excited. And, uh, and, I, and I thought to myself, well, all I want to do is just sell a little bit of pot, just like you. Why are you so excited? So he says, I got to take you out there right now. I said, well, okay. So we jumped in his car and off we went. And uh, about halfway there, he blindfolded me. And I thought that was very strange. And uh, thankfully, I trusted the guy, and uh, so we kept traveling, and we got out somewhere, who knows where it was, out in South Vancouver, and uh, we stopped, and he got me out of the car, and we walked into a garage, and that's when he took the blindfold off, and there I was standing before a, a garden like I've never seen before. And uh, that was suddenly when the light went on, and uh, when that... Uh, that how, it's hard to describe that uh, that that pain that uh, ended up in my heart and uh, it's just never left uh, the uh, the passion and love for growing has never left um, uh, as a disclaimer uh, yes 35 years ago probably did a few things that weren't uh, weren't legal but uh, I paid my debt to society and today I grow strictly for the love of the plant uh, for my own personal medical use, uh, but uh, given this opportunity to, to to share my experience with other other people, uh, it's a good thing. Yeah, uh, it's a great thing, and yeah, we'll just uh, reiterate that again that uh, you and I both are medical growers. We grow for our personal consumption. Uh, there's no, we are not cannabis sales in any way, shape, or form. Uh, just strictly fans of the plant nowadays and so we want to talk about it absolutely and and uh and even for recreational use uh each and every family is entitled to grow four of their own plants uh, here in canada and yep. uh i would love to be part of uh teaching everybody uh how simple it is how it doesn't have to be complicated uh, and uh, you can grow your own your own medicine, and uh, or, or for that matter, and, and grow it for recre uh, recreational use. 
uh, and um, and it can be a good thing. Absolutely, it can. I uh, it's kind of funny. I just kind of I I. I had a thought hit me as you were finishing up the last sentence there. Medical and recreational. Uh, I use it for both purposes, you know, like I'm smoking right now. It's first thing in the morning, uh, another thing. So it's eight o'clock at night when this goes on air, but it's six o'clock in the morning when we're filming this on the Saturday before, because it's just, we're early birds. We have shit to do later on in the day. Um, and I, I like to start my day off with a buzz. So it's, hey, you know, this is the recreational aspect now getting to the point I was trying to make I find personally when I'm trying to medicate for uh, aches or pains or whatever it is I find it's kind of uh, slippery slope is not the word I'm looking for but a fine line I think is more it where you have a couple tokes and you get to that you're just right or you're almost just about right and you just you want a couple more to stick it up and then you have another puff or two and then all of a sudden you're way far gone and you can't concentrate on this or that does that ever happen to you or am i the only one here well uh, yes i guess it's happened to us all probably more with uh, more with edibles uh, than uh, than than flour basically because you um uh, with Adam, I, I don't, I don't believe in the history of cannabis. Has anybody ever overdosed uh, from from cannabis? But the truth is, in an edible, you don't know the volume that you're getting, and uh, it can uh, it can uh, take you places that you're not really quite quite sure of. But uh, but uh, never to the point where it's going to uh, put you in the hospital or or, or kill you. Yeah, I've never. Uh... I, I've never heard of anybody actually dying from cannabis either. There's uh, conspiracy theories, I think, is all that is. But I was just kind of thinking, like, uh, but, but like what I was saying is, like, I didn't mean, uh, like, you get nepped up to the point of where you feel you got to go to the hospital. It's kind of that, just that walking that fine line between, okay, that pain is gone to, woo, now I'm having a little too much fun, kind of, is... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't want to jump all over the place here, Brad, but I just wanted to touch on something you know, along the lines of what we're talking about. Okay. When we talk about uh, recreational and medicinal, uh, and in many cases, when people talk medicinal, they talk CBD, which is the non-psychoactive effect of, of cannabis as opposed to THC. Uh, but I can also tell you that THC uh, can be a very good thing as well. Uh, and I'm thinking specifically of uh, people that suffer from PTSD. Um, and so what it does for them is uh, a couple of things. Uh, one, it when you smoke cannabis, uh, it kind of keeps you in, in the now, okay? So what that does for... Uh, people that suffer from PTSD, uh, coming back from the war and, and first responders and, and what have you, it helps them think about just what's going on now and maybe not what occurred in the past. And the other thing is uh, it really, it um, not only does it uh, help induce uh, sleeping, but it also um, quells uh, dr dreams. And uh, dreams can be sometimes nightmares. So these are two really positive effects of THC in, in, the, in the case of uh, people that suffer from PTSD. So uh, uh, cheers for, P, uh, for THC. <laughs> cheers for cannabis as a whole, as a plant, as a whole, you name it. Um, this, it helps so many people in so many different ways. Like, and like you just listed off two different ways of helping people, right? Uh, medically, THC and CBD. What about these other cat cannabinoids that we're just starting to learn about and hear about uh, that they have medical uses too? Um, I'm not going to try and go into detail on uh, each and every one of them because I'll end up mixing them up basically. I'm not that studied on them. It's just every time you see a new report come out, it's, uh, oh, here's another cannabinoid that we didn't really know about and it seems to have be linked to other health benefits. Like it's at the point where it's like, what can this plant not do? Um, it can literally be used to help you with your health, but it can also be used to build a house if you want to build hempcrete uh, type stuff, right? Um, it's 
Like, what can you not do with this plant? It's <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's it's really tr taken a bad rap uh, over the years. And by the way, that's another uh, reason that I was uh, wanting to join you uh, in the podcast is, uh, is, yes, it has taken a bad rap over the years. And uh, there's a, uh, a stereotype, a stoner stereotype, that goes along with it, and it's really, truthfully, not fair. It's not fair at all that uh, that people uh, are looked down on for uh, for smoking cannabis. Well, my thing is, uh, and I've always like looked at it this way: is what's the difference between me going home and smoking a joint, and someone going home and having a glass of whiskey or a beer or whatever the whatever their vice is, right? I. I I, do, I, I begrudge nobody to have a vice to be able to relax at the end of the day, whether as long as you're not hurting anybody um, while consuming that vice, right? Uh, we, we've all heard the stories of the alcoholics beating their wives or their kids and all that stuff, right? Um, I can't condone that. I've, I've, I've witnessed that kind of behavior personally, and when they're trying to put an end to it, if you can, and it's ugly behavior. Uh, I've also seen that kind of behavior, people strung out on prescription painkillers, opiates and whatnot, because that's the vice that they get strung out on. I can't think of too many times I've seen people that are cannabis users and like that is their drug of choice. Like I don't drink or do anything else. I just strictly cannabis user. Can you name to me or name me many instances of pure cannabis users going out and committing um, spousal abuse or anything like that? Uh, I, I really, I can't think of many, man. You show me a guy that's sitting in his basement smoking joints by himself playing video games, and I'm going to show you a guy that's not out there in the world fucking with people. But he's probably hungry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he spends a lot of money at the grocery store. <laughs> he's a yeah. good consumer. Word, word advice. Never smoke a joint before you go shopping, okay? Uh, save you lots and lots of money. <laughs> Or if you do smoke pot before you go shopping, you're going to have a lot of really good stuff when you get home. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so as much as I would love to, uh, you know, impart my, uh, my experiences uh, with you, I also look forward to you sharing your uh, experiences with me. Uh, uh, it's got to be a two-way street here, and I'm looking forward to learning more and more about your breeding projects. Okay, well, let's see what we got to talk about. So, just a couple weeks ago, we sprouted a bunch of violators that we had pollinated with our Chemdog Afghani F2. Uh, we did some videos of those on our YouTube channel a couple months back when those were going on. Um, the F2 uh, generation there, there was really nothing exciting in that that made me say, oh yeah, I've got to carry that forward to the F3 generation. <coughs> um, <clears throat> we held on to the number five phenotype just to hold on to something, but it's, uh, I'm ready to abandon ship on that even because uh, I want great cuts. I don't want good. I want great. And I just, I'm holding on to that one just really to say I did. But anyways, one of those males out of that Chemdog Afghani, uh, I did take some pollen from that, and I pollinated uh, a bunch of plants, and one of them was a violator. And you're a caribou resident, and you know that violator is, seems to be a long-time staple in the caribou region. Um, I'm sure it's popular other places, but honestly, I, I, I've never been into another place where it's like you talk to anybody on the street and they know about violators. Uh, yeah, yeah. It uh, seems, seems like uh, Pink Kush and Master Kush Ultra are another two very popular strains in the area that you always see. Yeah. But any, anyways, um, so the reason for the violator is I love that guano we smell to it. And it's an easily identifiable smell. As soon as you smell it, you know that's violator. And that's one of the things I'm looking for with my breeding projects is smells and tastes and whatnot. So I figured if I can find a male that has that nice violator guano -y smell and cross that with one of my Chem 91s or my Chem 4s that we've got, I just, uh, 
I'm thinking we're going to see some, we got, there's got to be something really good in there, or at least I'm sure as hell hoping. So that's the next one we've got coming up. Uh, that Well, it's kind of in play already, which is exciting. But like I said, they're just still sprouts. They're tiny. It's going to take them another couple months before there's anything really good going on there. But uh, we've got that one going on down the pipe. Right on, right on. Um, by the way, so I'm sorry to hear about the loss of your fish. Uh, do, you, do you think you figured out uh, what the problem was? No, I uh, I actually I even took a water sample that I meant to take down to the pet store here to see if they could test it out and find what was in there for me. But around that time, I did a big clean out of the bedroom, and I'm pretty sure that bottle you've got thrown out, just not really paying attention. Is you you know how it is when you got to declutter, just get everything yeah. out of there. Um, so I'm just really careful. I've only got the two plants going on in that system now. Uh, yeah. If anybody wants to go back on my YouTube channel, uh, you can see it. It's a uh, hundred gallon um, black tote kind of thing. Um, that I got from the feed store with the top part of a 55 gallon drum. And I just, I plumbed that into flood and drain. We got a super silver haze and a wedding cake in there. Um, and when I first put them in there, they, they, they were going slow. They weren't uh, taken off like crazy, but the last couple of days, I'm pretty sure the roots finally hit the aquatic root zone because they're starting to green up a little bit more, getting darker, they're bushier, they're getting taller and just, awesomeness all the way around so i'm getting really excited about that great great uh <clears throat> yeah i i'd like i don't know uh i don't know anything about aquapon very little i've, I've seen a few youtubes but um uh, I, you showed me earlier uh, you have some uh, seashells yep right yep. and and uh, and so what do you do with them like uh, you, you just put them right into your reservoir uh, oh, just nope. in a bag or Nope, nope, not at all. Okay, so uh, we'll we'll get segue into that real quick. Um, you so use them for top top dressing. Yeah, it's for top dressing. So I'll I'll sprinkle those just on the um like on the top of the dirt of my planters there, and that way when you water, it slowly gets brought down into the root system, uh, yep. where the microbes will do their thing. So now what Rick's talking about is I went down to our local feed store yesterday to get some feed for our chickens. And on the shelf there, I came across four kilogram bags of alfalfa pellets and crushed oyster shell. Now, alfalfa pellets is, I don't want to say a super food, but it is a really good food for your plants. It's got good dose of nitrogen in it, kind of a lower dose of phosphorus, sorry, and a medium dose of potassium in general. Um, the thing is, if you go and say get, say, Gaia Green Nutrients, you're going to have your NPK numbers listed on the bucket for you. And you don't have that benefit if you're buying the feed from the feed stores, right? It's not really meant for that. But we're going to try it out and see how that works. So I threw a bunch of it in a blender and ground it all up. Went into the veg room, top dressed a bunch of the plants in there to see how that goes. We'll water it down. Let it trickle, and then we're doing the same thing with the oyster shell and the for the calcium carbonate. As any grower knows, uh, uh, calcium huge major part of your plant structure and strength, health, and all that. And at so if you're looking at a dollar per kilogram for each of these, whereas if you go and get oyster shell at uh, once again, um, well, well, I would say Gaia Green Nutrients. You're looking at about 20 bucks, 15, 20 bucks for that thing. And you're nowhere near the weight on it, right? So just to show people that like nutrients are generally fairly expensive. And if you're willing to think outside the box a little bit, you can save yourself a lot of money. Um, yeah, 12 kilograms of feed for 12 bucks is what I end up walking away with. Where are you going to find that? You're not going to get that at the grocery store. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, which, uh, which, which, which lends to the, the fact that, you know, it, it's, uh, it's good for you to learn and, and understand and know a little bit about chemistry and, and uh, plant needs and requirements, and it can save you a lot of money. Well, and it's, 
I think a lot of it comes down to interest level as well. I understand that uh, I'm a little more fanatical about this plant than most people. And so therefore I want to get more involved with what it's doing. There's a lot of people that they just want to smoke it. They can't be bothered to grow it. They just please give me my joints and uh, they're happy with that. There's other people that they want, they want to grow it, but they just want it in the simplest form possible as, you know, basically is plug and play, I guess, uh, to, for lack of a better term, term, um, just so it's as easy as possible uh, for them, right? You got your nutrient feed chart and everything, and you just go down the list, uh, this part and this part and this part, and those work fine. I've got, you know, they, they, they work excellent. And, but me, I've got to screw around. I've got to have fun. I've got to MacGyver with it. It's, <laughs> it's I can't stop fucking around with it is what I'm getting. I get it. Yeah, I get it. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and uh, myself, how I've evolved with this is, yeah, when I first got into it, I just wanted to grow it. Uh, I just wanted to grow it. But now uh, it's come to the point where uh, all I want is perfection. I, I just want to try to do every, anything I can do to fine tune and dial in. Uh, and um, uh, I, that's where I get my satisfaction now. Yeah, I see that. See, I, I'm... I'll get to that point eventually, but right now I'm still just trying to figure out exactly what system and uh, what works best for me. So the damp and just try and get a, not a finely detailed dial in like you're trying to go for right now, just an overall flow, you know, I think, uh, you know what I'm trying to get out? I get, I get, yeah, I get it exactly what you're saying. Uh, and, uh, and your focus uh, right now is uh, is is in breeding, uh, and uh, everything everything will come in time. Uh, but uh, your focus is is actually where it should be. Um, when you look at uh, growing cannabis, uh, there's a, a list of the most important things uh, uh, that you must consider when you're growing cannabis. At the very, very top of the list is uh, is the genetics, is the strain that you're growing. Uh, all the I mean, truthfully, it is a weed, uh, and all the rest of it will come. But it all starts with the with the genetics, and and that's what you're focused on is finding that proper mix, uh, bring them together, create that uh, that uh, that perfect uh, clone, and uh, and then and then go from there. Yeah. Yeah, and it's definitely easier said than done, too. Um, well, I just uh, was talking about the Chemdog Afghani F2 line that I did, right? So I brought that to the second filial generation and ended up having to abandon the project because there was nothing that really stood out and shouted at me. Yeah, I held on to one cut out of that, but like I said, it wasn't because it screamed at me. It was because it was like, well, yeah, I might as well hold on to something. Um, and right before that, I did that GFX project that I did videos for the YouTube project, like immediately before that. So that's two uh, abandoned projects in a row. So it's not like, it's really easy to take a male plant and a female plant, make pollen and put them together and create seeds. It's not so easy to come up with an amazing cross, an amazing plant. And I think a lot of the part, a lot of it is to get back to what you're saying about genetics is that if I had had a really good male and a really good female to begin with, maybe I wouldn't have had to abandon both projects because what got me started with my breeding career was I, I had a pack of chem dog seeds because I knew I liked fuely smells and chem dog is my favorite strain. So I was like, at least I got one thing I know I want to fuck with. Right. And then, but, the seed market for especially in and around here uh it's pretty limited so trying to you know in i thought i was just getting into smoking uh weed again after i would quit for 14 years and had just picked up smoking again uh so i didn't know what strains i'd like or anything so i got a pack of afghani just thinking we've all heard of afghani you might find something good in there well out of that 10 or five pack of afghani i've got one male out of it so I didn't even get to pick and choose a male. I literally got the only male that I had to work with to choose from. Well, 
being my first breeding project and not knowing, I don't know if that's a good male or if it's a bad male. I just know that I got a male. Yeah. Right. So now we're at the point where I've learned a few things. I've blown a few projects, but I had a lot of fun doing it. I got to be clear about that. These projects are always fun. Yeah, it's a bit of a letdown when you, there's nothing special to carry on, but you had a lot of fun getting to this point, and let's be clear about that. Um, uh, where was I going there? I just kind of lost okay, my train of thought. Uh, yeah, but I just wanted to <clears throat> add something myself. So hopefully we can just feed off each other. And uh, yep. the thing I wanted to, to say uh, to, to people that maybe, uh, you know, aren't, as clear about the process uh okay you have a male and you have a female and you make baby just like in real life yep but the fact of the matter is uh mom and dad they make a baby and they make they make me and then uh they make another one and that other child seed offspring uh is nothing like me you know, they their their hair could be different because they could be a different sex. Yep. Uh, there, there's so many things that, and that's what where when you talk about breeding and pheno hunting, it's not just as simple as putting a mom and a dad together, and then uh, all the offspring are going to be ideally what you were looking for. Yeah, and well, in uh, yeah, that's a really good way that you just put it. How you could have another child that looks just like you, or different from you, different sex, different hair, what, whatever, uh, you know. And that's so when you make an F one generation of, say, we'll use the chem dog in Afghani that we were just talking about as an example. Um, you're gonna have a greater variation in your phenotypes uh, across there, right? Because you're going to have your ones that look like a cross between mom and dad. And you're going to have your ones that look like mom. You're going to have your ones that look like dad. You're going to have your outliers that you're not really sure probably look like the grandparents. If you take, so if you take, um, uh, let's go with chem dog because that's the line I like. So if you can find a chem dog looking male and a chem dog looking female out of that F1 generation, and you could put those together, that means the F2 generation, it's going to be a lot more like chem dog. So you're going to have uh, less of those Afghani looking phenotypes in there. And so that's the point of breeding on um, um, uh, multiple generations, right? You go F2, F3, F4, F5, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, okay. I get um, it. And then you're just weeding out uh, kind of that, the Afghani ish styles or, or the, the Afghani ish phenotypes. Or maybe you just find something really neat in a phenotype um, in there that you weren't expecting. And you just keep playing with that to try and um, slowly, that's how you wheedle out all, all the traits that you're not looking for, is I guess the uh, best way to cool. put that. And then you can also bring another plant into the mix at some point in time and breed that into there. Or you could have, uh, so I just talked about using a chem dog female and crossing it with an Afghani male, well, you could back cross it even. Uh, say I kept a cut of that chem dog female and kept that around. And then say an F3 or F4 generation where I've gotten a couple more chem dog leaning female phenotypes and just playing with those. Okay, well, you take one of those males and you back cross it to that original chem dog female and you're going to be even closer to the actual chem dog cut that you're doing. Okay. Like, so there's like, it, so yeah, it can really be just as easy as a male and a female and you're going to get seeds and you'll probably get something that you're happy with. I'm not looking for that though. I want to do something really good. I would like to put a, put my name on the map to some extent, and I would love to have a lot of local growers growing my stuff in their room. To me, that would be the ultimate, ultimate, um, not sure the word I'm looking for here. Uh, the, the satisfaction oh, well, isn't quite it, but uh, that would be the coolest shit in the world. I get it. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, keep at it, man, and uh, it'll come. It'll come. Yeah. Um, just curious about something else. Um, uh, I've always had a fear of uh, pollen uh, because uh, of the negative things it can do to to uh, to to a situation uh, if you're not 
purposely looking for uh, looking for breeding. Um, so, do you do you, how, like how do you control pollen uh, in certain areas without fear of it getting into an area you don't want it to be? Filtrate your air. Uh, to make sure you're filtering your intakes, your outtakes. Uh, keep your rooms as airtight as humanly possible. Because for <clears throat> a good example, of my very first grow space was um, basically a closet in our downstairs basement. A little area, just enough for like a small light and a couple of plants, like two plants. And then my second grow space was our downstairs bathroom when it was being renovated. It's actually my breeding room now because it's still in the middle of renovations and it's just a space I can use. There's a space of about 20, 23 feet between the two, the closet and the bathroom. And I had a male, or what What the fuck was it? What happened here? I can't remember exactly what the male plant was, but anyways, I had a male plant in, in that cupboard. And I had that I was fucking around with and trying to do some breeding with in that cupboard. Different room, you know, everything should be safe or so you thought. And then I had my actual bloom room for stuff that I wanted to smoke in the bathroom. And it's, yeah, the pollen travels. Because you got, if you got your fans uh, sucking air in and out of the bathroom, well, it's moving air from that 23 feet away and bringing it in there. So you got to filter the shit out of your air if you're able to. And yeah. I would even recommend, if you can, keep them in different buildings, if uh, even better. Because it's just... It's not worth fucking up your cash crop by uh, over a little hobby. And that's been one of my biggest problems is uh, having lack of space, lack of rooms. And so then I'll be I'll be playing Mr. Breeder Pollen Chucker and having a lot of fun with it. But then I'm ruining my good smokable crop with seeds, which, you know, we've all had seedy weed before and we know pain in the ass it is when you got to pick seeds out of every single bud that you're trying to bust up and the shitty tastes and the smells that you get out of them and like we're trying to grow good product here right so it's just it's to get those uh, far keep them as far apart as you can if possible yeah uh, yeah the short answer for the long answer i just gave <laughs> no, 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 no. i appreciate that i appreciate that but it um and I don't want to be jumping all over the place, but um, th earlier we were talking about uh, what should we talk about today? And uh, and uh, you were suggesting, you know, that I uh, use some of the, uh, the 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 game changers uh, over the over the last few years. And uh, I have to tell you that uh, it was about a year and a half ago that I went to a sealed room. And um, the reason I brought it up is because what you were talking about with, uh, with, with uh, pollen accidentally getting into your room. And, and of course, uh, a sealed room as opposed to a, a ventilated room, uh, that's the difference. Uh, you're uh, with a ventilated room, you're counting on air coming into your room and, and then of course uh, exiting. Now, so along with the air that's coming into your room, it can bring pollen, it can bring pathogens, it can yep. bring mold, it can bring spider mites. Um, and this is what I, this is one, just one thing I've noticed uh, uh, incredibly is that when I went, since I went to a sealed room, so now I control the whole environment, I control the temperature, I control the humidity, and I control the uh, the CO2 uh, uh, that the plants receive. Uh, I have touch wood. I have uh, totally eliminated uh, uh, spider mites, uh, uh, pottery mildew, and uh, and well, of course, and now pollen. I I don't have to worry about. I I live not too far from uh, an area that was. Uh, what that was uh, growing uh, hemp for a while and uh, all during that process uh, when they were growing hemp I, I it was always on my mind uh, gee whiz that some of that pollen gets into the air and ends up in my room uh, I mean thankfully it never happened but uh, now I have no concerns about that anymore 
other than the fact that you've got to ensure that you you're you're clean when you go into your room uh yeah. Um, you know, that's a, a, a vital part of, of, of growing is making sure that you're not taking anything into your room uh, inadvertently. Yeah. Yeah. And that's actually another good point. And it works just as well for pollen, too. So because uh, it's just as easy to have some pollen dust off your male plants onto your shirt or pants or whatever. And then you go into your bloom room where your actual good product is and you end up pollinating a bunch of stuff inadvertently. Yeah. So. I try and make it a practice of going and doing the stuff in my real bloom room first, do all the watering, the plucking and whatever needs to be done in there and then go fuck around in your breeding room. So it doesn't matter if you get covered in pollen because it's going to happen. Like I go in there and um, I'll basically, I'll take this little fan I got and I'll point it at my male plant. I'll just give it a shake and then you just see dust come yes. off. It's just, just like when you smack a tree when it's covered in snow, right? And it just poof. Yeah, uh, same, same thing. And uh, so obviously that's going to get on your clothes and on your body and you're going to carry that into your bloom room. So it's Good just yeah. uh, just try and try and keep that in mind that you will be doing stuff like that. So we were just talking a bit about advancements and stuff like that and like how you have been around a long time have been at this. And in that time, there have been a lot of really good innovations, I would imagine. And there's probably also been a lot of snake oil salesmen along the way that you've come across. So you just mentioned uh, the sealed room is a big uh, step in the right direction. Can you name off a couple more big advancements that you particularly have uh, been game changers for you in particular, I should say, that you really like? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we touched, I believe we touched on earlier uh, lighting and, and uh, that's probably one of the biggest advancements over the years. Uh, when you talk about the snake oil salesman, it was about uh, uh, 12 years ago, uh, I was introduced to uh, the concept of LED lighting and I really took a, an interest in it then. Uh, um, I've always embraced technology, but it's, uh, believe me, this old guy, uh, it, when it comes to these computers and stuff like that, it's just uh, leaps and bounds ahead of me now. But uh, I, I really try to focus on the technology of, of, uh, of cultivate, cannabis cultivation. Uh, LED, yeah, so, so I, I guess my first investment in LED was about 12 years ago, and it was a disaster. Um, uh, it was good. I mean, the the it, it was good uh, during the vegetative growth stage, but uh, when it came to flower the plants, uh, it just wasn't there. the The spectrum, uh, I guess, was the big thing. Uh, it wasn't what they define now as a full spectrum, so it wasn't getting all the proper lighting, and uh, so that was quite a disaster. Um, and that was a snake oil salesman that sold me the lights. I thought they were made in the U.S. It turns out they were came from China, and uh, of course, yeah, 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 I had no recourse on them. And uh, so, but you learn these things along yeah. the way. But um, uh, unfortunately, sometimes that's the best way to learn something is is uh, <laughs> through some disaster. Uh, so, lighting uh, uh, again, go back. Number one, genetics, and and uh, I have not been respond. You are part of that that g generation, but there have been a lot of other breeders out there that have done some incredibly fantastic things with with the the plant itself. And you know something? It's not always about THC. No, nope, it's not. Uh, uh, THC, yes, but a lot of it has got to do with um, if you're suffering from specific ailments, uh, uh, if you have trouble sleeping, if you have uh, specific pains and, and so on. And that's what the breeders today are, 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 are doing it. They're, they're focusing. Uh, the research has been going on in, in uh countries all over the world, uh, Israel uh, takes the lead in, in uh, cannabis research, uh, but it was just in, here in, um, here in um, Colorado where uh, they came up with the uh, Charlotte's Web uh, 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 CBD oil, which uh, has just uh, changed the lives of children with uh, suffering from epilepsy um, uh, incredibly. Um, 
losing my train of thought, but, um, well, no, okay, number one is genetics. Number two would be lighting, and uh, the LED lighting has, to, to today, uh, is nothing what it was like 10, 12 years ago. LED is, uh, is taking over as far as uh, the latest in, in, in the concept of lighting. Um, uh, just a couple of other things, uh, one, uh, grow medium, um, uh, hydroponics has always been the leader in, 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 in the, uh, the best uh, way to cultivate. Uh, um, the, the only problem with it is sometimes it can be uh, less forgiving. Uh, and that's why a lot of people, not not because they were lazy, it's just uh, it, it was just a safer way to grow, went to a soilless mix. Uh, and um, uh, so there's pros and cons of, of both. But now they've uh, they've come along with uh, they they're taking uh, cocoa core and uh, using that as a medium, uh, and uh, which has really been a, a quite a breakthrough. And I did touch on as well the uh, the fabric pots uh, that uh, that people are growing in now, which uh, gives the uh, roots uh, an opportunity to prune all by themselves and. And, and the, the big advantage there, of course, is uh, plants are only fed through the root tips. So the more root tips you have, the, the more opportunity the plant has to intake nutrients. And with a conventional plastic pot, what happens is the roots uh, grow to the outside of the pot and then they just start to circle. And uh, there's, uh, as long as they're circling, there's only one end of that root. Uh, and so, um, now, with the roots uh, being able to uh, multiply, it, it's uh, quite beneficial. Huh, that's really cool. I, yeah. I was unaware that they fed just from the tips of the roots. I just, uh, just unaware of that. It's interesting. Learn something new every day. Yeah, yeah, and then of course that's the the main benefit. Uh, is exp I've never, I well, I've had excitement when. My, my children were born and and uh, and uh, other excitements but I'll tell you the first time I ever removed the uh, the root ball from a from a uh, uh, from a, 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 a from a fabric pot uh, I tell you it was pretty exciting it was pretty cool I never like I'm so used to seeing the the roots all bound at the middle where here yeah. it's just all one solid solid root ball, uh, just an enormous root ball. And, um, and that's where all the, uh, you know, uh, that's where all the action happens. That's, that's the stuff you can't see is what's producing the fruits of your labor, uh, in, yeah. in your plant. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, I remember a couple of years ago, I tried taking a shot at growing hydroponics. I figured I was already using the nutrients. Let's try the actual hydroponics and uh, I was doing DWC in five gallon buckets and when you lift those out and you see those huge roots trailing down oh man that was like it, it was really cool like uh, I really enjoyed it but just I don't have uh, I can't always be there to check my pH two three times a day if necessary and if something does go out, out like say I get sent out of town for work and something does happen while I'm gone well yeah, it's, you can lose everything. My wife's are always around. Um, God bless her, and she'll do what she can. But she does. She doesn't have the knowledge that I have. So if there's something comes up and you need a quick fix, she might not be able to get on it fast enough. So it just dirt farming for us seems to work better. And then from there, we just decide to make the switch to organic altogether. Uh, just in this last year, or so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I've, uh, you talk about uh, deep water culture. Uh, yes, the, 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 those that those roots in the water. It, it's really cool. What my what my challenge was, and when I that's when I finally gave it up, was the the roots. They 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 they're just incredible. But then what happens is they start growing down the drain hole and yeah. plugging it up, and then of course you got flooding and. Uh, Nobody likes a flood. No, <laughs> no, it's a pain in the ass. Don't like that at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so you're right. You have to, you know, like if you have the time to be in there two, three times a day, you know, maybe it's for you. But uh, if we're, if we don't have that kind of time, 
and dedication, uh, it, it can be sometimes more trouble than it's worth. Yeah, and I think that's just another wonderful thing about this hobby is because there is so many grow styles to be able to do it. There, And no one of them is the correct way, right? There is no one and only correct answer to this question, or right? It's just uh, so many different styles to try out and you can try them all out if you want to have the time or the patience to try it out and find the one that works for you. Uh, it's just... And that's another reason why I really enjoy having you on the show now is because we grow different styles. I mean, so we can just dork out and be like, oh, what do you got going on there? And then it's vice versa. So it's just, yeah, yeah. it makes for exciting conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A concept uh, that uh, I've just gotten into recently um, is uh, there's different methods of feeding, of course. Uh, the, the, the method I'm using now, it's called drain to waste. And uh, so what that means is, um, as opposed to say a, a recirculating system where you're reusing the, uh, the nutrients that you put through the, the, uh, your, your grow medium, uh, with drain to waste, uh, the concept is you, you, uh, you, 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 dial, you dial in your nutrients, uh, you, and you make sure that the pH is balanced and then you uh, water your plants. Now, when you water your plants, the, I, the objective is to water them to the extent where maybe you've got about 10% runoff. And that 10% runoff, it actually, you get rid of it. You don't reuse it. Um, in cocoa, it's, uh, it's, uh, pretty much required that you, you have to water every day. Some, in some cases, uh, twice a day. Uh, so when you go in the next day, you make, you mix up a brand new batch of nutrients. Now the plants from the day before, they will only take up the calcium, the nitrogen, the potassium, the phosphorus that they need, and the rest of it will remain in the medium. So when you go in the next day, again, you've got all your, 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 your nutrients are all dialed in, the pH is, is uh, balanced, you water again, and then again, you allow about a 10% runoff so that you are effectively uh, getting rid of all the excess uh, nutrients that the plant didn't take up, and you're giving it a fresh batch to work from. So every day, that's that's how you're doing. And in a case like I've noticed that I uh, I haven't uh, experienced uh, um, well not as much de deficiencies, but uh, 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 nutrient burn of, of certain, like uh, excess nutrients in my in my in, in my soil. And I, you can see that in the in the in the plant. Is, does the plant look happy? Does the plant look you know the right color? Uh, and, and so on. And um, yeah, so far I, I'm enjoying that system. That's good. How, how long have you been on that system with for? Um, I'm going to say, I'm going to say just about, uh, just almost a year, almost a okay, year now. So it's still fairly new to it then. Oh yeah. Still fairly new, but you got the point where you are getting it dialed in really well at the same mm -hmm. time. Well, I, and you learn, you, you learn so much along the way. Like, uh, for example, um, uh, when I talk about uh, growing in cocoa, I also add uh, perlite to that mix, uh, anywhere from 10 to 20% uh, perlite. And the main reason for perlite is, uh, is because the cocoa is so uh, porous, uh, the perlite will actually help retain some of the moisture. So when I water, when I water, sometimes what I like to do is, is if, if say I want to give my plant uh, half a gallon of, of, uh, of food, uh, I will give it maybe, uh, 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 maybe a, a quarter uh, or say, half, say a quarter of a gallon. And then I will wait maybe an hour or two hours to allow the uh, the perlite to soak up as much as possible, and then I'll come back and I'll give it the the the, the balance. So, and then again, I'm watching for that drain that runoff at the bottom. So I know that uh, the plant is is it's holding more of the nutrients uh, for a longer period of time. 
but again, that's just always uh, fine tuning and dialing and yeah. Having fun with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's a, it, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's my passion. It's a, it's my, uh, yeah, it's my love. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we know now that we know you're a cocoa farmer uh, under LEDs. What what are you using for a nutrient system, uh, really? Or what what what, what, been, what yeah. nutrients are you using? Or what I've line I should guess? Yeah, I've been using uh, the Remo line of uh, nutrients. Okay. I don't know if you're familiar with them. I know of them. Yep. I've yeah, I've never tried yeah. them. It's a, a, a local, uh, it's a synthetic uh, nutrient. Um, uh, uh, it's a local, uh, well, local. Uh, he manufactures out of uh, Maple Ridge, uh, uh, BC. And uh, actually he was employed by, uh, by uh, Advanced Nutrients at one point uh, until he broke off on his own. And uh, he makes a line that uh, is, uh, has, is, has been, <laughs> Uh, recognized uh, through the, uh, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I think it's been approved, and, and you know maybe I shouldn't be saying this unless I know my facts. But I do believe it has been approved through Health Canada uh, as a uh, uh, as a, an approved uh, uh, nutrient to use for for uh, for medical cannabis. Uh, and it has every it has everything in it you need. It, it's a little it's a little more involved maybe than some systems. In most systems uh, of feeding nutrients, uh, it's a three part system, uh, um, which is basically you've got your micronutrients and then you've got your grow uh, nutrients and your flowering nutrients. Um, this uh, this uh, system here uh, in grow, there's four parts to it. There's a micro and a grow and a, a CalMag and uh, and uh, well they call it, they call it uh, a Velo. Uh, oh. Any anyway, what it is, it's uh, it's uh, the microbes, <clears throat> the, mi the beneficial microbes and bacteria that uh, that that they that is is part of the system. And then when you go to flower, it's actually a six part system. So it, it is a little more involved. There's uh, uh, other other uh, nutrients that are good for the, the the flowering and they they put it all in the one package um, one thing I do not use anymore <clears throat> excuse me is uh, hydrogen peroxide which I was using uh, uh, to um, to give more oxygen to the roots um, uh, uh, again, about a year ago, I started using uh, a product called Recharge, which is uh, beneficial bacteria and, and microbes. And if you use, uh, if you're using microbes and, and beneficial bacteria, uh, the hydrogen peroxide is is going to kill kill all the microbes. So, what I do now is I use, uh, I just use a, an air air bubbles uh, in my reservoir. To get to get more oxygen into the uh, in into my mix, right. and uh, yeah, and then uh, I also use um, uh, hydrozyme hydrozyme, which is a uh, an enzyme formula which which helps keep the uh, any of the dead roots. Uh, it helps keep them clean. Okay, I've I've seen that product in the store quite a few times, and uh, I don't even know if I've ever actually picked up the bottle. But you know, just when you're going through the grocery store, looking at all the stuff you've never used, and you're kind of like, oh yeah, I wish I could afford that and that and that and that. And I've done that with Tiger's Eye. It is a bit overwhelming. It is a bit overwhelming. I, I uh, yeah, and everybody, you know, they. they I mean, well, it's their job to sell you uh, sell you nutrients, so uh, you can't blame them for that. But uh, yeah. uh, and you can get as simple or as involved as you as you want. And um, but I guess just find out what works for you. Yeah, I think that's it. Um, when I very first started growing, I uh, really didn't even know what I was doing. So this would have been just over four years ago, and. Uh, Quick uh, backstory before that, like 
going through high school, I was your typical waste case stoner. I fucking didn't want to do nothing but sit there, smoke pot, and do fucking nothing, accomplish nothing, etc., etc. Shortly after high school, a buddy and I, we rolled a quad really bad, and a day or so later, I went over to his house, smoked a joint, and I thought my kidneys were bleeding. And just from that day, they weren't, it was an anxiety attack. Um, it just, but from that day forward, smoking weed was never the same again. And I quit smoking it shortly after that because of the anxiety, right? You do drugs to have fun. And if it's not fun, why are you doing it? 14 years later, we'll fast forward to right before, a couple weeks before my wedding. Uh, I decided to take up smoking weed again, just for no, re no reason in particular. My wife is a, a very occasional smoker up to that point. Um, and I just shot a bag in the freezer. Hey, is this stuff any good? And I had, I think I had two puffs off that joint and man, did I ever get so fucked up, but I had so much fun. And then I just sat there on the couch and watched trailer park boys for like three hours straight. And well, here we are. Um, where was I, where was I going before? I? Oh, told boy, you, you know, I I'm sorry. I was too involved in that conversation. I who <laughs> were you were going? <laughs> well, but that's allowed. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, where were you going, uh, getting involved with it? Oh, yeah, okay. So when I first started growing, um, I for just over four years ago, I didn't realize you even needed to flip your plants uh, into a bloom cycle or anything. So I literally, I was as green as it gets. Um, we had chickens, so I knew like stuff like chicken shit would be good for your seeds uh, to help grow, but I didn't know you'd have to like compost that first, otherwise you're going to burn them. Anyways, we went down to Paul's Organics in Williams Lake. We'll give them a shout out. Great store. And I was in there, nothing cannabis related, probably like tomatoes or something. And I see that they've got all these seeds there, right? like cannabis seeds. Crop King seeds was the banner I saw. I was like, is that real? She says, yeah. Can I go look at them? Yeah. I'm like, this stuff's illegal. But yeah, but you can, right? Because you know how weed's kind of always been legal. Well, not always, but... It, in recent years, it's been legal even before, or was legal even when it wasn't, kind of. You know what I'm saying there? Yep. Like, uh, it's been really less, a less, little more than a slap on the wrist. So I go in there and I buy a pack of Purple Kush and a pack of Sour Diesel seeds. And, but come home, try and grow those. I throw the Purple Kush into basically a pile of dirt and chicken shit and nothing happened because I fried the seed. And then I was like, oh, well that didn't work so then i decided to go to the feed store here in town and i don't know anything about this stuff and i started asking questions and the lady there puts me or tells me to use a plant uh, prod called plant prod it's got high mpk numbers and so I'm okay yeah i'll go with that and i use that for about the first year and it's my and i I'll, i should also point out that i was using one of those uh blurple leds a little cheap 600 watt light and well, my, my results at the time were I was getting about an ounce and a quarter per plant. Uh, those were my yields. And then about a year later, I was like, this is stupid. I've got to be able to do better than this. Like, this doesn't make any sense. Like, I'm not even getting better at what I'm doing. I went down to uh, Interior Garden Supplies. And uh, the lady behind the counter there, she got me into using Innovating Plant Products. Or Yeah, Innovating Plant Products is the line and of uh, hydroponic nutrients and at the same time i picked up a 600 watt uh, hps light and that was where i saw my first huge jump right there i went from an ounce and a quarter to three and a half ounces uh immediately and that first plant was actually the chem dog that you've heard me talk about before that i love so much that was four and a half ounces off that one plant i was like so it's like okay you see a nutrient system that I'm sure does work if you know how to dial it in a little bit better. But then I went to that three-part nutrient system, hydroponic nutrients, and it was just like, like, oh, well, and a proper light though. That's the other big thing is I went to, I uh, got rid of that blurple garbage and it was, it was huge, huge. So uh, yeah. 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 Uh, again, Number one uh, is genetics. Number yeah. two is lighting. <clears throat> and number three, <clears throat> I would categorize as environment, uh, which is your air, 
your air supply, your CO2 supply, your air flow, your air intake, your air exhaust, your environment, and then and then uh, comes your nutrients. Uh, I would say in that in that in that order. Yeah. 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 Because I've uh, I've seen lots of well, you know that I've I, I do my own strains, my F ones and stuff uh, mostly. And around the time I did that chem dog, I did some F ones of uh, with that Afghani pollen. I did a Durban poison, a raspberry diesel, white widow, and I feel like there's another one I'm forgetting. Uh, and I pass those seeds around to certain people, right? Hey, hey give these a shot. And I get pictures um, back of these plants looking great, and they're just sitting outside. They're not getting any nutrients at all. Just water from the garden tap, and yep. they look great. And you know why that is? It's because they have a really good growing environment. You're not going to find a better light source than the sun. Uh, you got all that air movement and all this other goodness going on. Um, and as long as your soil is healthy, soil health, that is another huge one, right? Which goes into your environment that you're just talking about. If your soil is healthy, you got all those microbes in there to do the work for you. Uh, it's setting another yourself little, up for success. <clears throat> another little side story. For and this was like really early in my in my experience. Uh, I was having some problems uh, getting some uh, some some cutting started, and I had them uh, going under a fluorescent light, I believe, at the time. It was in August. It was a beautiful sunny day, and uh, I thought, why don't I just put these outside and just see how things go out there? Uh, well, uh, despite the fact that the sun is 93 million miles away. I came back an hour later and everything was just fried. It was all gone. It was all gone. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it I, is it is the best light source, but you have to respect it. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I did the same thing when I was talking about those sour diesel and purple kush seeds that I bought for my first grow. Uh, yeah, I think it was a purple cushy again that I had, uh, in this nice little dome thing thinking, oh, it's nice and hot outside. I'll put it out there and this thing's really going to take off. No, I cooked it like <laughs> almost instantly. <laughs> right? You got to harden your plants off. You can't just throw them outside in the blazing sun. Uh, <laughs> they don't like it. <laughs> no, no. And I hope we learn from all these, uh, these experiences. That's the important thing. <laughs> well, they... I'm one of those people, I learn from my mistakes. Often at times I've got to fuck something up to learn from it. Otherwise, do you even know if you're doing anything wrong? Uh, That's right. right. Yeah. And just yeah. try not to duplicate those mistakes again, uh, if you're able to. That's for sure. That's for sure. <laughs> so we've touched on a couple strains now. Um, uh, now, back when I was in high school, uh, your typical stoner waste case there that I was mentioning, there was only a couple strain names that we had heard of. I think we'd heard of like Early Pearl, White Widow, Hash Plant, which I didn't even realize was a strain in like Northern Lights. But mostly it was like there was good weed and there was bad weed and purple weed was almost always good. In your time as a grower, has, has have you always been going by strains or was it always kind of similar where it's good weed or bad weed? And if there was always strains that you were able to get a hold of, are there any really good strains that were around, say, back in the 80s or 90s that they just don't seem to be around anymore? Um, the thing that the one thing that, that you have to remember is when I first started, uh, this was a this was a just a, a all cannabis cultivation was in, in its embryo stage. And uh, I was really dependent on uh, keeping my own strain alive. Uh, uh, I've since, uh, I, 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 I'd like to count on other people to, to get my, to get my, uh, my clones from. But in those days, I, I had to do it myself because there just was nobody else that I, that I was uh, aware of. So, um, I kept uh, I kept uh, a Northern Lights uh, going for quite some time, and uh, I found the I found that to be an excellent strain. Um, uh, not only did it grow in incredibly nor uh, enormous uh, colas, uh, it, uh, it it was a, a six week uh, flowering uh, uh, 
Wow. Uh, strain. Yeah, six weeks. It was just, and and that's just about unheard of. I, you know, today, it, you know, a, a normal strain would be eight to nine weeks uh, indica, and, and sometimes eleven or twelve if it's a sativa. Um, so that that was one that I, 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 the biggest problem with that one was the the cold, the the buds grew so big that uh, you know you you would experience uh, root rot uh, or not root rot bud rot every, every now and then you have to be careful of your humidity um but there's eh, like a, nothing really stood out um, other than that i'll be honest with you I, it's, i'm thinking back uh, i remember um you mentioned uh, M mk ultra yeah <clears throat> probably one of the the uh, the best strains I ever grew were. Uh, by the way, I, I just got to tell you. Uh, you know what I used to do in order to uh, hide a fart? I would cough. Now I fart to hide my cough. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, anyway, one, one of the uh, one of my favorite strains, uh, the best one of the best strains I ever grew was Master Kush. Not not MK Ultra. It was just Master Kush, and um, it was it was uh, the taste, the flavor, the high. It, it was just it was just incredible. The problem was the yield just wasn't there, and and um, and I guess that's what made people just it made it not that attractive to grow anymore. Uh, uh, but the MK Ultra. It came along later. It was uh, it, it was uh, right up there as well. Yeah, it's a pretty badass strain. It's it seems to be a pretty good staple around the Caribou area here, or the yeah. the, the hundred mile area of the Caribou at least. Um, I could think of quite a few places you could go and find that, which leads me to believe it's all probably the exact same cut actually. But what can you do? Well, but that's yeah, I've grown both. I I have grown both, and I I did find uh, definitely the uh, the uh, the master Kush the uh, the the internode space was quite quite a bit different than the uh, than the MK Ultra. The MK Ultra the the buds were closer together and they stacked a lot more. Where the uh, the buds on the master Kush were quite a far apart, and they weren't nearly as big either. Oh, what, well, what, sorry, what I was getting at was like if uh, all the MK Ultra cuts in the area, I, I, I believe they're probably oh. all from the same plant. Okay, it seems yeah, to yeah, be yeah. that way. And that wouldn't surprise me if that's the reason why there's so much violator in the area too, is it's all mostly from the same plant. And just, yeah. you know, it's a small community. A lot of people that'll watch this show, they live in places like Vancouver where you're literally surrounded by millions of people. But our community is of about 2,000 people. <laughs> so, like, uh, it's, you know, it's, it doesn't take much for, if you got 2,000 people and, say, 200 of them are growing pot, good chance a few of those cuts are going to make it around. So Absolutely, yeah, yeah. You know, Vancouver is more like a, a smorgasbord. You can just about find whatever you want down there, but uh, we're a little more... Uh, we we don't have quite as quite as quite a, as much on the buffet to pick from. Yeah, well, and that you know, and that's honestly another reason for me wanting to do stuff like this podcast and making the YouTube videos, cool, so I can start reaching out and making connections outside of our own little bubble of an area here, because the, like the cannabis cultivation community, it really is a big community and a big following, and it's a very accepting community. More importantly, um. Just, um, you, while well, you were watching uh, last weekend, I did that uh, Cannabis live panel on there and I made a couple of really good friends um, during that show that I've been in constant contact with uh, since then. And uh, there's, uh, you know, there's the possibility that can help out with genetics that we can't get in this area, right? Uh, it's just... Yeah. It, you, like I said, you, well, you said when you first started off, you kind of had to keep your own stuff going because there was nothing else. And there is a lot of kind of that going on in, there, in our little bubble. Uh, that's what I'm getting at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where does uh, Terp live? Terp um, honestly, I'm not sure where he's from. I know he's south of the border. Okay, okay. I wasn't sure if he was or from 
from uh, Eastern Canada, but uh, oh yeah. No, no, I'm pretty sure he's south of the border. Uh, he told a story about getting, uh, it's not really my place to story, but to, to tell, but yeah, he was up in Canada really briefly and went back to the States pretty quick. I guess we'll leave it at that, but uh, yeah, so he's, uh, you know, he's, he's going to see if he can maybe help me out with a project there. Like I said, I mentioned that on the last show. I don't want to go into it just in case for whatever reason it doesn't pan out because, uh, you know, leave people hanging, but it, it, it's a good one. It's a, cool. it's a good project. It's, uh, good. Good I, I think I, that, I think I've told you what it is already. So yeah. that's, uh, yeah. that, that's good enough. And, uh, there'll be more videos coming for that, but yeah. you know, without, um, without me doing this podcast to trying to get back to the original point and trying to reach out of our bubble here and make some other connections, that relationship would never have happened. Right. Um, so there's, there, there's, uh, it just opens up the ability for us to bring more genetics for us to play with and for breeders like myself to try and put more out. And that's another reason for, uh, why I would encourage anybody that has the itch to try and play with breeding cannabis, everybody should go ahead and try it. Make your own little personal stash of seeds. You don't have to be uh, a, a, like a breeder of elite genetics to have fun with it and make your own seeds and grow a pot that you're going to be happy with, right? I'm yeah. a bit of a weed snob or not even a bit of a weed snob. I am a weed snob. I, I don't like shitty weed. I've got pretty high standards. Um, so... I, you know, I like, a, like my standards are here and if something gets to here, sorry, you don't make it uh, into the next generation of breeding. That's me. Everyone should give it a shot and you never know what you're going to come up with. You might find out, uh, uh, like the saying is you might come up with the next, next cookie strain, the next chem dog. You just never know. Cause those really were bag seeds as far as I know. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, yeah, it's, uh, it's exciting and, uh, and it's ever changing and, uh, who knows where it's all going to go. That's for sure. Yeah, no, that's the, that's the, it is so exciting because I think of, uh, even the advancements that I've seen, even in, like I said, I've been at this just over four years now and, uh, LED lighting, I've, I've only tried that one blurple that I've just mentioned. But you, I, I've been looking into LEDs the whole time because I was the guy that tried to cheap his way into growing and tried to, you know, save a nickel by spending a dime kind of thing. And that doesn't work. As I found out, you're better off just to shell out the money for the best equipment that you can afford at the time. And uh, But looking into LEDs, yeah, there's been huge advancements in the last couple of years, uh, and of course, they're all going to be relatively expensive, but you got to spend money to make money. So the saying says, but, uh, but, uh, it, it doesn't really matter, uh, what, uh, where you jump in, uh, I'm not saying six months from now, it's going to be obsolete, but it, it, there'll be something better in six months. Uh, yeah. it's, just, it, and it, it's the same thing with computers, with refrigerators, uh, with, everything in general uh, that's just how it works and uh and um yeah 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 absolutely it's uh just uh, that revolving door of progress that's the way it is so the other thing is i think people got to be like i'm one of those people that i'll research the shit out of something if i'm about to drop a small fortune out of it because i want to get the bang for the buck factor and i think when you do that if you're willing to spend uh like by the HLG 650Rs that just got released earlier this year, right? I know what those were worth. And you got to realize, like you just said, that when by the time you drop that small fortune on those, a couple months later, they're not the greatest thing out there anymore. There's something that just came out. That's right. And, uh, but that being said, you go out and spend that small fortune on those lights, you're going to be happy with them. Right? They're, they're just because they're not the next greatest thing out there anymore doesn't mean they lose value uh, uh or doesn't lose they mean they lose their ability to do their job right they're just as good as they were the day you bought them well and and, and uh, just uh, and again i don't want to jump all over but uh, touching back on on leds uh that is one really neat thing about them is uh 
um, the, the, the diodes are probably good for like 50,000 hours, where with a conventional uh, high pressure sodium or metal halide bulb, um, you, you should be really, really replacing those bulbs every six months. Yeah. Uh, six, nine months tops. And uh, where these these other bulbs, you're, uh, the, the diodes, you're probably getting close to 10 years uh, uh, use out of them. Yeah. Yeah, and that's and huge. as powerful as the day that you first plug them in. Yeah, so it's uh, a lot to be said for them. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I like I've I'm I haven't uh, gotten to try out any proper LEDs yet, but that's definitely on the next thing on the list. Hopefully, in the coming year, we'll be able to take that step and have a project like going on. See how that does. Throw that yeah. in the bloom room. What it would be actually because in my bloom room right now, I've got uh, some 630 watt ceramic metal halides on one side, and then the other side is 1000 watt HPS lights. And so you can already see the difference in between those. So it'd actually be nice to get a really good LED and then you could do a side by side by side. Yep. Yep. And you were also what... doing you were also doing the comparison of the uh, the fabric pots to the uh, plastic pots. Did you notice much uh, uh, variance there? Um yes and no. Um it's the, uh, I'm just trying to think of, I think I had, uh, I think I had thicker growth, uh, like more, um, as you're bending down in the scrog and shit like that, you got the extra shoots coming up. I think those were a lot thicker on the net pot side or on the root pouch side. And then on the plastic side, I think my plants got taller. I'm not quite as thicker with all the extra branches coming off as you would um, fold them under the scrog. Okay. So I'm not really sure exactly what to think about that. So in this next round, where well, when I went to re reuse the pots for the next round, it was uh, Slurricane and Super Silver Haze. So, and we've been growing each of these strains for a bit. And uh, whereas it was just a shit mix in that aquaponics table, Heinz 57 of a million different strains kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so this, this one, the super silver haze went in the net root pouches and the slurricanes are in the plastic pots. Ah. And so we're going to do a little bit more focused uh, grow. I've got um, a Gorilla Skittles which has been one of my favorites. And we're talking about strains that were like really kick ass, but don't yield that much. Gorilla Skittles falls into that. It's but one of the greatest tastes and smells of any strain that I've tried recently. And I've got that in a five gallon uh, root pouch that we're trying out now. And then I had an Amherst Sour Diesel that I don't know what the fuck I did with it. I transplanted that from, uh, what was it? whatever it was in into a five gallon root pouch and the leaves just they're fucked I, i'm not even sure what the deficiency is on them but they're just they're they are brown and scabby kind of the same thing that happens if your cat gets into your grow room and pisses in your plant uh how they all go brown and curl up like that i'm sure you've seen that in your time that's what it reminds me of I, and I, I, there, there's no cat getting into this bloom room. I, I can assure you that I do. So I can't figure out what I did, but I've said on other shows um, recently that I've actually been in a recent rash of transplant shock. I think usually I'm pretty good and it doesn't uh, do much to my plants. They just seem to carry on, but I've had leaf discoloration and all this uh, trying to figure it out. But that Amherst diesel that I just put in the pouch it's fucked. I don't know. And it was, it was an immaculate looking plant, like beautiful, lush, dark green leaves. And yes, like, what the fuck? Really? Wow. Wow. Hey, listen, um, when you were talking earlier about the comparison with those two plants, this is just a theory that I just, uh, I, I'm just coming up with. Okay. Just want to throw it out there. Um, you compared the uh, you, you you said that the plants in the uh, in the plastic pots had grown taller. Now I know that there is a uh, uh, a, a, a direct correlation between the uh, the root ball 
and and the, the plant structure. Uh, I think in Mother Nature, what happens is uh, a tree and the roots will grow out, uh, they'll grow out, and normally that will define how far they grow out, will define how how tall, the how, how wide the tree will grow. Um, so here's my thought, uh, that because it was in a plastic pot, the roots were confined to a certain area and so it would grow it would show more vertical growth with in the, in the, in the root pouch containers even though the, the 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 roots didn't grow out as far there were more of them and maybe because there were more of them it it showed more uh uh, development in your plant, uh, something like that. I, I'm just throwing out a, a weird. I, yeah, I, I think I see what you get. Like, well, just uh, how it is above, it is below, kind of thing. Uh, yeah. More, 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 more air pruning leads to more roots, which leads to more stems and branches above ground. Whereas uh, down below, or in the plastic pots, longer roots because they're circling the pots a bit equals maybe longer plants and uh yeah. you got like longer roots but less of them and, and longer plants with less branches and uh there's also a saying uh, and it's uh more roots equals more fruits that's that's kind of a rule of thumb and um along the same lines um uh well oh oh yeah well, what i was going to say is um i used to grow uh uh uh, in five gallon plastic pots. Now I grow in three gallon fabric pots. Uh, and yet I'm still getting as much or more yield per plant uh, from the plastic pots. See, that's that's another interesting one. Um, when I first started growing, I would uh, do it in five gallon pots. And through watching a whole bunch of podcasting and also talking to you at shop, I've act uh, when you were at the store there, I've switched to trying to do three gallon pots now and do my finishing in three gallon pots whenever possible. Um, and now, as I as I said, I'm starting to slowly switch over to the three uh, to the fabric uh, pot. Although, being that I am still a dirt guy and I'm not looking to water every single day, I might go with five gallon uh, root pouches just for the uh, extra little bit of dirt in there. But I'm going to try side by sides of the threes and the fives just to see which ones work best for my purposes. Exactly. Uh, that's a good point. And that was what I was going to say is one of the downsides is, is at one point through the process, uh, I may find myself having to water like twice a day instead of just once a day. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm using a smaller, a smaller container. Yeah. That's interesting stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, anyways, uh, yeah. I, just one more quick point I want to touch on is uh, these podcasts. Um, to to anybody who's who's watching or listening, uh, there's a lot of really really good ones out there, and uh, um, you know, um, it's, it's so easy to do a search for for cannabis podcasts. Uh, uh, I can recommend a, a number uh, of really good podcasts. Uh, well, why uh, don't you uh, shout out a couple of the podcasts that you like to watch? And if uh, I've got different podcasts that I like to watch, I'll shout them out too. And we'll just give some of our watchers uh, just a, a good so good couple sources of information they can find. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a I'm going to make a, a short list. But right off the top of my head, uh, n number one is uh, the 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 Dude Bros Show, yep. uh, which Huge is, uh, 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 it, it's very entertaining, extremely knowledgeable. Uh, they have a nice, uh, they have a nice format. Uh, they've got really good guests and, uh, and uh, a shout out to Scotty, who's a member of the, the Dude Grow Show. He also uh, manufactures uh, the Re Recharge, which, uh, should be part of uh, just about every grower's uh, uh, nutrient regime. Uh, another one that I've re been enjoying recently is uh, Green Jeans Garden. Okay. And uh, he, uh, he uh, actually what I really enjoy about him is his, 
his uh, growing style is similar to mine. Um, uh, but he also is a big promoter of uh, LED lights. Okay. As a matter of fact, I believe he may even uh, he may even uh, uh, sell some, uh, do some uh, promotion uh, of uh, LED lights, uh, homemade. You know, like you, you buy a kit, and you make them yourself. Yeah. yeah. Um, another one uh, uh, off the top of my head is uh, Bill Ward. He's from uh, from Eastern Canada, Halifax. I want to say. Uh, um, not quite a, a, as old a guy as I am, but he's uh, obviously been around and uh, and uh, really knows the stuff and, and has got a good way of explaining uh, explaining uh, his uh, his uh, situation. Um, uh, Rasta Jeff, you you probably heard of him. Yep. Uh, He's huge, a huge, huge fan of his podcast. Huge, huge podcast fan of his. Yep. Man. Like, oh, yeah. 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 Definitely, uh, he uh, he tells a good story, and uh, and but there's many many more out there. I, one that I'm just oh, Mr. Grow It, okay. now, and I do believe he uh, I think his name is Chris. Mr. Grow It, uh, he's a uh, he's a Canadian and, uh, and and extremely knowledgeable. And uh, you know what I've done in my experience is uh, I'll I'll watch and listen to different podcasts and uh and then sometimes i will see a pattern um uh, like in uh, there's so many debates out there for one great debate is uh, uh defoliation to de to to take off leaves or not and how you should do it and uh, so i'll listen and watch to all the different podcasts glean a little bit from from everybody and then i'll form my own conclusion i you know, nothing, if we took everything that we saw on the internet as gospel, uh, we'd all be nuts. You'd by, never by get anywhere. <laughs> no, you have to use your own common sense. <coughs> what? what? Did, you, did you just fart again? Twice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so take from it, uh, you know, what, uh, and then make up your own conclusions. And uh, and that's how you uh, you move on in this life, yeah. All right, so to throw you on the spot real quick, defoliation, what's your opinion? My opinion is, and it's a long, I don't, I don't, I don't want to make a long story, but um, leaves, uh, leaves are there for a reason, okay? Yep. Uh, and especially if you're growing outdoors, uh, I don't believe too much in defoliation. But indoors, uh, we, uh, we it's up to us to, to control the environment a lot more. Yep. So uh, when I'm growing indoors, I, I want to make sure that the, the bottom part of the plant uh, has got lots of airflow, air, air circulation, airflow uh, to prevent uh, certain uh, uh, climate zones building up, little heat pockets and so on, uh, areas for uh, 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 powdery mildew or, or spider mites to, 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 to grow. So yeah. for that reason, I'll clean up, I'll clean, I'll take everything off about the first third of the plant. Uh, and, and then again, because we are trying to, uh, we're trying to um, replace the sun and so on. Um, uh, so to allow the light to penetrate in through the canopy, I do. I'm selectively taking leaves uh, from from the whole plant, um, and it's more like a visual thing. I, I can see well if I if I take this leaf off, then I'm going to get to more of the bud sites there, and uh, and so that leaf has got to go. In some cases, what people would prefer to do is tuck the leaf underneath and behind to allow that bud site to get more light. And then the other thing I try to avoid is after um, after about the third week in flower, then I I pretty much I, I like to think that I've done everything I'm going to do because every time you pick off a leaf, you are it's a living, breathing thing. Yeah. It has to experience some shock. Like imagine somebody ripping off one of your arms and how you might. Be affected by it so on a smaller scale that's what happens every time you uh, you take a leaf off you break uh and, and it does go into some form of shock with age oh. comes wisdom and you've got lots of age behind you <laughs> you call me old guy for nothing <laughs> no, they don't. Hold on. you earned that title bud <laughs> right on man right on 
Well, listen, I uh, I really sh I got to look at starting my day here. I was just about to say the same day. thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. We'll so we'll start wrapping it up. So before I go, I'll just uh, you're not a social media guy, are you? You're just kind of. Uh, well, I I I've I've been dabbling in it. I, I'll be honest. I I pulled right away from. Uh, pretty much all social media, including Facebook. Um, but there was t there's two things about, uh, about social media. One, um, when my father passed away, um, the, the, uh, from my, my list of friends, uh, you know, the love and, and, uh, and so on that came out of it, I, it, it, was, uh, it, it was very moving. On the other hand, the negativity that uh, comes out in social media is uh, was enough to just make me go you know what i just can't take this anymore and i totally got out of it um, what i've done since is i formed an alias and i sneak into facebook every now and then just to see what people are selling and uh, i might see something i might want to buy and then i get out <laughs> but that's pretty much it so it kind of and then i kind of i thought well you know like instagram and all these other ones i mean they're what's different about them so I never really uh, pursued much of it, but I but I have uh, I I just just to get more knowledge about cannabis, uh, uh, I have uh, signed up for Cannabuzz, and I'm you know I'm slowly moving my way through that, and and I think I'm going to do the same thing with Instagram uh, again, so I can follow you know you and and certain right. others that uh, are using that platform, yeah. All right. Well, what's your handle on Cannabis? We'll throw that up there and see if we can't get you some followers on there. I, I can't even remember what my... Uh, let me think. Can't be that hard. It might be... Okay, it might be... Let's be Buds. B-U-D-Z. We'll try yeah. that one first. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to go back and I'm do I'm searching for you right now. <laughs> let's be buds it was actually it was a uh it was a uh a, a little business i was thinking about trying uh trying and all i wanted to do again was just teach people how to uh grow their four plants uh in at home or in their backyard yeah. and uh, i started the well i had all the business cards printed but then uh, living where i live and and uh, I just, you know, I have, I have the uh, the desire, but I just don't have the <laughs> whatever time it's going to take to pursue that. But having said that, you know, using a, a, a platform like this, I, I can maybe do the same thing. If, you know, if absolutely people are interested in just growing their four plants, uh, you know, and they decide to follow us and ask questions, and uh, uh, yep. we'd be more than happy to uh, to help them any way we can. Well, that, that's another thing uh, I'll point out. Like right now, this show is being pre-filmed and edited and stuff so, uh, before it gets aired on Sunday nights, just so that we can get our comfort level with what we're doing. Before long, I want to start doing these live, though. I think that would be great. And then we can get uh, following in along on the live chat and asking questions and just turn it into an interactive bullshit, bull, uh, interactive bullshit yeah. session and not just the two of us. Yeah, I, so, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. You, you're definitely going to have that opportunity to be able to do that and uh, impart as much knowledge as possible. Cool. Right on. Right on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, so I was I tried finding you on Cannabis on my phone real quick and I wasn't able to. So when yeah. I go through and edit this, I'll, I'll track down your Cannabis handle because I'm pretty sure I am following you. And I'll just throw that on the screen in writing there so everyone can read at read it where you're at and find you on cannabis right on right on and, and then uh, i'll just uh i'm gonna do some shout outs myself here yeah um, if anyone wants to find us they can find us at caribou heart organics on instagram you can also find us at caribou underscore heart underscore organics on cannabis we do both platforms but honestly we definitely prefer cannabis as opposed to instagram cannabis is the place to be uh go there there you Posts are getting blocked and banned off Instagram for being cannabis related, even though um, they seem to allow other ones to go on. Uh, cannabis isn't like that. Um, 
we also we've talked about all the negativity on Facebook. Whereas if you go into a Facebook uh, cannabis growers group and you ask a question, you're going to get 10 different answers from 10 different people that all say theirs is the best and only method that works. You don't have that on cannabis. It's a very accepting group. You ask questions and that, that the, the big thing that they're trying to wheedle out is all the trolls with the asshole answers is uh, what I should be saying, I guess. Yeah. So you can find us on there. And of course, watching us on our YouTube channel here. So you'll be able to find Rick and I on here every week, Sundays at eight o'clock. And then when we do the live shows, we might end up doing it at a different time. We're both morning guys, so maybe we'll end up doing it at like a live wake and bake show or something like that. We'll see. We've got lots of time to test the grounds and pass ideas back and forth between then and now. Cool, cool. And uh, give us uh, your wife's uh, uh, cannabis uh, handle as well. That's right, that's right. We can't forget the better half of... My, my life for sure so my wife you can find her uh, she's the IT department at Boo 420 on Cannabuzz and so as I've said before I do most of the growing and most of the smoking she does all the cool artsy fartsy type projects uh, a couple weeks ago she made cannabis chapstick she does salves and creams for achy muscles and joints and she does all of our edibles so She's going to be doing videos uh, um, and posting them on our Instagram page. And as I think she's going to start doing her own short videos and putting those up on our YouTube channel as well. As it, it, alongside the stuff that she's posting on her uh, cannabis page. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So give her, cool. a, give her a follow as well. Right on. Right on. Yeah. There's so many different ways to consume cannabis uh, and uh, edibles and salves and ointments, uh, tinctures. Yeah are all all uh, uh, different man I know recently I've been I've been uh, using a uh, uh, a cannabis uh, uh, a tincture uh, 20 20 parts CBD to one part THC and it's really been helping me with my arthritis well, that's yeah. good to know another uh, interesting one is you mentioned Charlotte's web there earlier oh yeah and we're we're growing Charlotte's web right now yeah, we've that's got, exciting. We've got three plants that are about three feet tall right now. I'm thinking maybe next weekend or the following weekend, we're probably going to throw them in the bloom room and see what happens. Wow. So that's exciting times. And then, of course, you know I'm going to breed the shit out of that. We've already cut a few clones off of, our, off of all of them, and we're just kind of waiting to see which ones we like the best, and we're going to do some high CBD, high THC uh, crossbreeding. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd be interested to see the outcome of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it should be good. For sure. Okay. Well, okay. I think that's about all I've got, if that's all you've got to say. Yeah, yeah, no, it was uh, it was good. I enjoyed the time with you. Yeah, thanks for joining me. This was a great time, and I definitely look forward to doing it again next weekend. And uh, once we get a few uh, kinks ironed out, then we'll look to do start doing our live streaming. Sounds great. All right, buddy. And uh, to everyone else, uh, it was great to, great talking with everyone. Everyone have a great weekend, and we'll see you next weekend. Rick, I'll talk to you sooner than later, buddy. Sounds good, my friend. Have a great night. Bye now.